Good morning. We're coming on the air with breaking news from the Supreme Court. The justices handing down the highly anticipated ruling on abortion. In this historic decision, the Supreme Court has now overturned Roe v. Wade. The landmark decision ended constitutional protections for abortion that had been in place for nearly 50 years. The court's three liberal justices dissented, writing, quote, with sorrow for this court, but more for the many millions of American women who have today lost a fundamental constitutional protection. For the last seven months, we've been looking into the anti-abortion rights movement to try to understand how they've gotten to this point of overturning Roe v. Wade through a case called Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. We revealed their years-long strategy to pull this off, their playbook, what's next on their agenda, and most importantly, what this will mean for the millions of people at the center of this issue. My name is Kaya, and I'm here today at the Planned Parenthood for a surgical abortion. I'm kind of nervous, scared, and also not having the support with me sucks. But, you know, I'm trying to make the best decision for myself and for the baby itself. Kaya is 18 years old, and she's struggling with an unintended pregnancy. She's 12 weeks along. Hello. Dr. Aman al Sadin is the medical director for Planned Parenthood's Great Plains region. Kaya is one of 50 patients she's seeing today, and one of tens of millions of women who could lose access to abortion care. We're just going to ask you a series of questions that are required by the state of Kansas when you're getting an abortion. Are you going to want to know how far along you are based on our ultrasound? Um, no. Okay. And will you want to see the ultrasound image? No. Will you want to receive a physical copy of the ultrasound image? No. Do you want to know if you have a multiple pregnancy, like twins, triplets? No. Why did you decide to terminate your pregnancy? Because I knew that I couldn't give a life that was deserved. And also, I was just too, I'm too young. I know that there are single parents and young mothers out there who have done it and can do it and are fully capable, but that's just not my situation. There are a lot of states that are outlawing abortion right now. Kansas is kind of in the middle of this sort of sea of red. And I wonder how your life would be different if you couldn't terminate your pregnancy. I would not be able to maintain a job and work and take care of a baby full time. I would um, probably ultimately give the baby up for adoption. There would be a piece of me out in this world that is just somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that was devastating for me. I couldn't, that's why I'm here. I can't, I can't do that. Was this an easy decision for you? Oh no. Oh, hell no. This was a very hard decision for me. I cried for weeks. After I saw the sonogram, I, I cried instantly seeing the sonogram because my heart was filled with love, but also with fear and just hopelessness. And it was rough. It was very rough because I would never see myself in this position, ever, ever. I had always been super careful and it just happened. The anti-abortion rights movement has been quietly laying the groundwork to outlaw it at least 10 states have already enacted bans. So for millions of women across the South and Midwest, Kansas is one of the closest states that still has legal abortion care. That could soon change. In August, voters will decide whether to reverse a state constitutional protection that would open the door to criminalizing abortion. For a lot of people, Kansas is sort of the last place they can go to access this care. Are you concerned that abortion could be outlawed here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think about that every day. Um, 
And that could be catastrophic. How do you expect your clinic will be affected in coming months? There's going to be kind of this displacement that happens when these very populous areas don't have access to what I consider basic health care. We'll do as much planning as we can, but this clinic has the capacity to see a certain amount of people. It's not nearly going to be enough. What are pregnant people facing unplanned pregnancies going to do in the South, in the Midwest, who don't have access? We're looking at a situation where most people won't be able to access it, and then you have this like state-mandated forced pregnancy, forced birth situation. I mean, I don't see how the maternal mortality rate isn't affected by this. When you don't allow people that are very sick or have dangerous pregnancies to have the option of having an abortion, in order to maintain their health or save their life. Um, you're gonna end up with more complicated pregnancies, higher infant morbidity and mortality, and higher maternal morbidity and mortality. That's been proven time and time again. Control over women is what they want! For years, one powerful Christian legal organization has been meticulously planning a strategy to overturn Roe v. Wade. With God's help, we don't just stand, we win. Alliance Defending Freedom, or ADF, has been involved in 67 Supreme Court victories and single-handedly won more than a dozen, mostly related to religious freedom, like fighting for prayer in public schools and to make it legal for businesses to discriminate against same-sex couples. In cases like Dobbs, which the Supreme Court just ruled on, this is how ADF works. First, they identify like-minded legislators, attorneys general, and governors. Then, they write bills for those lawmakers to tweak and introduce. They offer free legal advice. If the law is challenged, ADF helps defend it in court. If they lose, they appeal. And eventually, they petition the Supreme Court. This is exactly what they did with the state of Mississippi in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. In short, their plan worked. I'm looking forward to this next presentation by Denise Harley. So she's senior counsel for Alliance for Defending Freedom. Thanks for your expertise. Thanks so much. I'm so excited that we do have this connection with these faith institutions. The important thing is the message and the culture of the sanctity of life. And I totally believe when abortion is no longer mandated, we are going to start to wake up and realize that we were in a, a collective veil of ignorance in this nation. ADF senior attorney Denise Harley agreed to sit down for a rare interview. She leads all of ADF's work involving abortion. ADF and, you know, your, your colleagues in the movement have done, you know, what many people thought would be impossible for the last 50 years. How have you done it? Well, uh, we give the credit and glory to God, frankly. Um, we are a faith-based nonprofit, and um, what we've seen is something that we probably never could have imagined. So what was ADF's role in this Dobbs case? So we worked very closely with Mississippi from the very beginning, um, including we um, had a hand in crafting the legislation of the 15-week bill, coordinating, advising them during the pendency of the litigation. And then at the Supreme Court, we have been you know, alongside them all the way, offering just as much help as we possibly can. Would you consider yourselves co-counsel in this case? So Denise has already said as much as she could possibly say about our involvement. So okay. we really can't address any more questions. Okay, but just to clarify, did you all write the arguments at the center of this case? So again, we, we really can't address anything having to do with like our involvement past what Denise has already addressed. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Could you speak to that, you know, strategy of baiting the opposition abortion providers to, you know, sue the state for, you know, what they see as an unconstitutional law? You can get to the Supreme Court by losing or winning. Okay, so if you lose, you get the opportunity to appeal. If you lose from a federal trial court, then you can appeal to the federal appellate court. If you lose in the federal court of appeal, you can petition to the Supreme Court. That's what Mississippi did in this case. You know, I think there are a lot of people in this country who have woken up in the last few weeks and said, what is happening? There are states across the country that are passing these bans, including complete bans. How orchestrated has that effort been? 
states are now saying, we finally have the ability to protect unborn life, to protect maternal health, to get rid of this gruesome procedure that we believe has been um, destroying families and traumatizing people and absolutely taking innocent human lives to the, the tune of hundreds of thousands a year. I wonder if, you know, well-organized, well-funded Christian legal organizations like ADF, writing legislation, you know, sharing that template legislation uh, in states across the country, offering free legal services, defending that legislation in court. I wonder if, if that's democratic. I don't, I guess I'm not following your question of what would not be democratic about the whole idea and the basis of America. We have free speech, we have freedom of religion, we, we have the freedom of conscience to have beliefs, to act on those beliefs, to share those beliefs, to assemble with people who agree with us. It's not lawmakers in these cases who are writing the laws, you know, and so I think there are a lot of people who feel like there are organizations like ADF that have more influence than really voters do. And in this case, about what women are and are not able to do with their bodies. Oh, well, goodness gracious. This is what all, um, you know, interest groups would try to do and aspire to do as much as possible. ACLU, Planned Parenthood, NARAL do this all the time. That's what the First Amendment allows. Of course, there are a lot of women who would argue, you know, what about my freedom to make medical decisions with my doctor about my own body? Well, I would say abortion is not healthcare. It is, uh, it's a procedure that takes a human life. And that was never a, a constitutional or fundamental concept that um, a woman or a father or a doctor or anyone would be able to take an innocent human life. It's definitely not one of our constitutional rights. I, I think people wonder why, particularly when these things aren't public, these are private meetings, why these groups should be able to, you know, dictate the lives of millions of women when it comes to this decision. I mean, ADF doesn't get to dictate anything. Our vision for a healthy America is that abortion is unthinkable and unnecessary. After the Supreme Court announced their decision, ADF confirmed they were in fact on Mississippi's legal team and wrote the arguments at the center of the Dobbs case. On the state level, ADF's playbook only works if they have solid relationships with lawmakers across the country. Now that Roe has been overturned, the power goes back to the states. But in order to understand what's happening in state legislatures across the country, you have to come to the epicenter, which is the Texas state capitol. Texas didn't wait for the Supreme Court's ruling on Dobbs. The state made headlines in September when they passed Senate Bill 8, known as the Texas Heartbeat Act, or SB 8. The law gives civilians the power to sue anyone who helps a woman get an abortion. State Senator Brian Hughes authored the bill. It's now been used as a model by more than a dozen other states. Hughes agreed to show us which states have already or are likely to outlaw abortion. 13 of those states have trigger bans that can now be enforced since the court's ruling triggered them last week. Many of these states, like Texas, had pre-row statutes that stopped abortion except to save the life of the mother. So they'll come back into effect. And of course, many states have also passed trigger laws. Texas, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, of course, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia. The chances are pretty high. Iowa, of course, I want to say Wisconsin as well. I think Michigan is also on the list, isn't it? Indiana, and the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Montana, Idaho. So what we're seeing now is that more than half the country is certain or likely to ban abortion or attempt to ban abortion basically overnight. That's right. That's exactly right. What happened in Texas can help explain what's now happening in other states. After SB 8 passed last September, abortions in Texas dropped by 60%. Since then, there have been roughly 3,000 fewer abortions per month. Thousands of women are leaving the state for care. Others have no choice but to go through with their pregnancies. Did you consult with any women, any moms while drafting this bill? Oh, yes, we certainly did. In fact, we've heard testimony from uh, women really all across the spectrum. Uh, some women who have 
uh, chosen life and are glad they did. Some women who made the choice to have an abortion are dealing with that. I wonder more about the moms who have comorbidities, who are living in poverty, yes. who could die and do die during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. Did you consult with them? Speaking about the mother's health, I want to be clear, in Texas, if there's a risk to her life or to her health, then there's an exception. So we've had that in Texas for a long time, and that's still in place with the heartbeat law. And I think it's just important to note, though, oftentimes the mother's life is at risk well beyond the point that they can have an abortion while they're in childbirth and postpartum. You know, even months after giving birth, women can die from complications with pregnancy and delivery. And so you're talking about a condition that the doctors don't, aren't able to detect. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm not yeah. trying to argue. I want to understand. I want to follow yeah, what yeah. you're talking about. No, my I'm point sorry. is this. Maternal mortality is yes. a massive problem in Texas. Yes. You're 43 on the list of, of states when it comes to that issue. For many people, forcing them to go through with a pregnancy and with childbirth can put their life at risk. The people of Texas uh, feel strongly that that little baby growing inside her mother's womb is a human being worthy of protection. And so we set out to protect the little baby's life while we love and support and respect the mothers during and after the baby comes. During the women's rights movement of the 1960s, the Supreme Court ruled in Griswold v. Connecticut that the Constitution protected the right to privacy as it relates to birth control. This laid the groundwork for Roe v. Wade. And then eight years later, justices decided abortion was also implicit in that right. January 22nd, 1973 will stand out as one of the great days for freedom and free choice. At the same time, in the early 70s, the country's most famous anti-feminist advocate, Phyllis Schlafly, and her grassroots organizers ensured the Equal Rights Amendment was blocked. When you make uh, the laws apply equally to men and women, you end up taking away many of the rights that women now have. The ERA would have given women equal rights in the Constitution. It would have also cemented their right to abortion. You're listening to K-Talk Radio, KBJA 1640 AM, bringing you live local two-way talk. Good morning. This is Gail Rizika at K-Talk Radio. I'm here with Marianne Christensen and Mary Taylor. And uh, we are going to be talking today about something great and exciting, of course, and that is the overturn of Roe versus Wade. One of Schlafly's main deputies was Gail Ruzika. She's been wielding power in Utah politics and beyond for decades. Gail had a hand in writing the abortion ban that was just enacted in Utah. Her main goal for the last 50 years? Do whatever possible to overturn Roe v. Wade. We're not through fighting because the other side will continue to try to make abortion legal. Well, Gail, they really are talking about that already. We've got to stay on high alert. Uh, one of the things that I am hearing is that the pro-choice side is complaining that the rape exception should not have to require a police report. If there doesn't oh, need yes. to be a police report, then we are just protecting perpetrators. That's the first place they're gonna start trying to chip away at our trigger bill, and we, we need to stand our ground on that. The fight will never be over because, you know, the fight for life never ends. What do you remember about when the Supreme Court announced their decision on Roe v. Wade? It was a shock. It was a shock when it happened. And, and then it was everybody just kind of said, now what do we do? So it seems like that Supreme Court decision really fueled the movement. Well, of course, yeah, it, it, absolutely. For me, it started with that. I suddenly had to start figuring out what can I do? What can I do to make a difference on this? How, how can we stop this from happening? There's got to be something we can do. And, and we gotta do it fast. Never in a million years did I think, you know, it's gonna be 50 years from now before we have a chance to stop this. How has the pro-life movement been so successful? One legislator one time was speaking to a group and I was in the audience and he acknowledged that I was there. And he says, when I get there in the morning, she's already there. And when I leave at night, she's still there. But she does change her clothes, so I know she went home. And that really is who we are. It's not just me. And we try to all we'll work together. And the big thing is trust and trust and not caring who gets the credit. I wonder how Alliance Defending Freedom ADF has helped with that work. Oh, they're, I, I, love, I love ADF, they're, they're so helpful. I've never called them for anything on, on this issue that they haven't been right there with answers, what can we do to help. And they're very good at it. And they're very good at it. 
What do you make of the younger generation now leading parts of the movement who are relying more on social media or making, you know, polished videos that go online and get millions of views? It's wonderful. The only thing I always tell everybody is don't just get on there and talk about the issue and then do nothing. You have to do something. If you have a sign in your hand, I want you to raise it. One, two, three, raise your sign! Millennials and Gen Zers are now all over Instagram and TikTok, racking up views by pushing anti-abortion messaging through a much younger lens. Saying that a woman won't be as successful if she has a child is actually pretty misogynistic and degrading. You want a culture that minds their own business when innocent human beings are being killed? Honestly, that sounds like something slave owners would have said so proudly. In the last several years, they've framed that messaging with leftist language, feminism, science, human rights. It is the sexual revolution and the abortion movements, both largely driven by men, that have waged the real war on women. Women, we weren't made to want to kill, to destroy. We were made to fiercely fight to protect. That is authentic feminism, a feminism that demands true equality under the law for all people, born and pre-born. Lila Rose became a national figure after she filmed undercover at several abortion clinics and posted the videos online. They went viral. I want to terminate this pregnancy right. because of but no, the gender. Like so. I said, because the... Um, don't tell us that. We, do. we don't want to know. After Planned Parenthood threatened legal action, accusing Rose of deceptively editing footage, which she denies, Rose sought the help of ADF, and ADF saw an opportunity. They backed her legally and gave her media training. And a pro-life star was born. Why do you do this? Well, it's my passion. It's a group of students and I, we do this work together to investigate Planned Parenthood and hold them accountable for these crimes. The science is conclusive here. Biology is clear here. Human life begins in the womb. It's possible to make our country and our world pro-life. Rose has become a sort of messenger in chief for the anti-abortion rights movement through her media company, Live Action. Our following is now nearing 6 million combined, and our view count is, I think, at one, over 1.5 billion now, combined video views. That's a huge amount of people. It's a huge amount of people. And I just wonder if there is a sort of strategy style language that you're using that really speaks to our generation and younger. Social media is a really powerful engine, and it can be a powerful engine for good or for bad. But when you combine it with facts and creative abilities to make it really uh, attractive for people so they can really understand it, human interest stories, I think that's a winning combination. Do you have a sense of how many minds you've changed, people who were going to We do, actually. So it's really exciting. Our most engaged followers are teen um, and young 20 women, like 18 to 24 women. And when we survey them, 38% of our last surveyed group said that their minds were changed on abortion. It's not lost on you that the other side's criticism of you is that you're misleading, that you spread misinformation. What's your response to that? Yeah, the misinformation is coming from the pro-abortion side. That's lying about the humanity of the child. That's lying to women and telling them that violence against a family member is empowerment for them. That's saying that you can't do better than abortion, that that's what you're going to have to do if you want to pursue your dreams. I'm interested to know like, what you would say about women who, of, of whom there are many in our country, who got an abortion and were empowered by it and don't regret their decision. Well, there's always going to be stories that people will tell themselves to justify what they did. And I think that's one of the really sad parts of the pro-abortion movement is when they then they really like stuff the pain or the hurt down because women feel like they have to walk around and say like, I'm glad I had my abortion. Maybe you're not giving I don't, women I don't, enough I mean, credit for making their own decision and not being influenced by anyone and being empowered by that decision. I mean, do you feel like you're giving women enough credit? I think a lot of the women and the, I mean, the thousands of women that we've interviewed or surveyed or talked to over the years, the common theme when faced with a pregnancy where they felt like they had to have an abortion is pressure. It's fear. It's feeling like they have to do this. A recent UCSF study showed that five years after having an abortion, more than 95% of women said it was the right decision for them. In 2019, there were more than 300,000 abortions in the 26 states that have or are likely to outlaw abortion imminently. 
For the thousands of people who will be forced to carry out their pregnancies, the anti-abortion rights movement says there's a catch-all solution. Pregnancy Resource Centers, or PRCs, like this one. PRCs are typically funded by anti-abortion rights advocates. When PRCs or crisis pregnancy centers, both of which have been accused of spreading misinformation and persuading women away from abortion, have faced legal turmoil, ADF has represented them in court. How are you going to learn to be a good mom? By um, following through with my therapy and learning from my doctors. This is Courtney Barker. She considered abortion in her first trimester, but decided to research adoption instead. So what did we talk about today? Um, that there is actually resources here in this program for adoption, um, that there's families actually waiting. So this is called a life book, and it's just them sharing their life with you. Aww. Their kids, Look at why them. they're <laughs> adopting, what's important to them. The cottage provides food, mental health services, job training, and a pathway to adoption. What would you look for if you were looking through these books? Probably someone like Alex and Stacy that are young. Looks like they're really compatible. It's a big family right That's there. That's a big family. You <laughs> see, that would be perfect, you know? The cottage is also a maternity home where she and other mothers with unplanned pregnancies live. Once their residents give birth, they offer formula, diapers, and a bassinet for up to a year. While this is a lifeline for those who have access, there are many more moms who do not receive the resources they need. Several years ago, Courtney was diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia. She self-medicated with meth, cocaine, and alcohol. And before landing at the cottage, she was homeless. She's now in recovery. Mental health is something that I think is hard for a lot of people to talk about, even though it's really common. Are you open to talking about some of those challenges that you've had? Yeah, actually, yeah, I would like to. What are some of the symptoms that, that you experience? My erratic behavior. <laughs> I suffer with anxiety a lot. My behavior would have acted out in the past. Um, I'm now dealing with that and looking for other coping skills, other techniques to express correctly. When the baby's here, is there any part of you that worries that like your symptoms of bipolar and schizophrenia may resurface or that you'll relapse in some way? Yeah, I worry about that a lot. I was like sleeping on a park bench a year ago, six months ago, and I want to be a soccer mom all of a sudden. Like, <laughs> doesn't mentally, that doesn't make sense to me. So there's just a lot of emotional preparations. The number of people who need support, like Courtney, will likely increase dramatically. Oklahoma recently passed a near total ban that criminalizes performing an abortion at any stage of pregnancy. Far more women will now likely be forced to give birth, often at the most vulnerable time in their life. Lana Smith, executive director of The Cottage, is preparing for that influx. There's always going to be women who are hurting and find themselves pregnant and need help, no matter what the laws are. And so we are headed to our new maternity home. It's on about 100 acres on a ranch. What are the real life challenges that these women real are facing? Life, yes, real life challenges. All of our, obviously, clients who live in our maternity home were homeless before and living on the streets, right, under, um, in, in, a, in an alley or underneath a, a highway. Um, I mean, yeah, we've seen them everywhere. If they're not homeless, they're bouncing from friend to friend's couch and usually doing things, giving things that you know, they normally wouldn't want to do, but they have to because... Like prostitution? Like prostitution, anything. Um, you know, selling drugs for someone, doing things that they wouldn't want to do, but they feel like, I have to do this because I have to have a roof over my head, I have to have food to eat, I have to have some type of safety. This is my new room. Uh, this is where I'm going to be sleeping, and then the baby's bed's going to be right there. I'm going to be keeping all my baby stuff in here. So before I moved in, I decided that I was going to name him Sam. They had this which I th think is just a sign from the gods. <laughs> yeah. If you didn't have help from these organizations, where would you be? I mean, I, w I would be in a really bad place. Is there any part of you that's still considering adoption? Yeah, I mean, there was. 
Well, I kind of really just got over that. <laughs> so have you made your decision? Yeah, I'm going to keep him. Wow. Yeah, he's going to be mine. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's kind of awesome that I get to have that feeling and I get to realize that it is a choice mm -hmm. and it is an appropriate one. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to open first? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is your first baby. It's such an incredible, life-changing event. You will be an amazing mama. Wish you all the best. Love and always. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I know. Me too. <laughs> With this new law, you know, inevitably there are going to be a lot more women in need. Yes. That's expensive. Yes. How will you afford to serve them? All of our funding is donor and grant funded. We've talked to legislators, we've talked to state representatives, and talked to them about ways that it could change in the future. We are busy, but we can always take more moms. We can always expand our services and help in any way we can. The Oklahoma legislature has allocated $3 million to supporting the 6,000 women facing unplanned pregnancies each year. Split evenly, this amounts to roughly $40 per mother per month. Add the thousands of more women who will now be forced to carry out pregnancies, it's not nearly enough. We're at the Oklahoma State Capitol to meet with Senator Nathan Dom. He's written some of the strictest abortion laws in the country. What's clear is that these laws will create an incredible financial burden. What's unclear is who is gonna pay for this. Are there enough resources for these mothers, particularly women who would have tried to access abortion but now are unable to? Yes, there, there are plenty of resources out there and available. Um, and not only just from the resource side of the, the woman being able to care for the child if she chooses. So how much public funding goes to these mothers in need? Um, I don't have the statistics on that. I mean, I can get you those specific numbers. Um, but um, there, like I said, there's not just public money that goes to it. There's also private resources. Do you have a sense of how much it costs to raise a child in this state? Um, in Oklahoma, I mean, our cost of living is much less than a lot of other states, but um, it's not inexpensive for sure. But again, if the individual doesn't want to incur that expense and everything, there are adoption opportunities. I guess I'm trying to understand, you know, how you know that there's enough resources when you don't actually know how much it costs a mother to raise a baby. Well, because with the pregnancy resource centers that I talk to, they have more than enough supplies that they are continually reaching out to, and they're proactively trying to give out their supplies and trying to help these mothers. How do you measure that? I mean, you seem very confident that like, this won't be a problem, but there were nearly 5,000 abortions in this state in 2019. I mean, that is a lot of women who are gonna be looking for alternative options. And for a lot of particularly low income women, they're gonna have to go through with these pregnancies. We've had an increase in revenue and everything. So we can always, if there is that increased need through the public side of things, we have that, that option and that flexibility to be able to put more money into that um, if it is not being met through the private sector or other means. While lawmakers make promises to provide a safety net for mothers, it's often states that restrict abortion that have the weakest social programs. On the private side, PRCs and maternity homes can be life-saving for women, but funding isn't consistent or reliable. So when one of these homes loses a lease, for instance, it can be devastating for their residents. They end up homeless, their lifeline gone. Hi, Dr. Ray. Hello. How are you? Hello. Let me help you. That's what happened to 27-year-old Dasheree Crooks. Hi, little bud. Thank you so much. What's his name? Uh, Arias. Hi, Arias. <laughs> Aren't you a cutie? Dasheree and her five-month-old son, Arias, have been couch surfing at friends' houses since her maternity home closed down several months ago. Hi! There's your smile. That's what I was looking for. They live in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the states that's outlawed abortion in the last week. As these laws go into effect, there will likely be thousands of more people landing in Dasheray's position, broke and in need of support. I think a lot of single moms don't really get enough credit. Just the mental stress that they have to go through and, and then you try to keep yourself together, you know, because you want your baby to see the best part of you. Can I ask how much money you have in your bank account? Nothing at all. I have put in a lot of applications. 
And, you know, I just found my son a babysitter. So I'm now able to do interviews. It's like you need childcare to get a job. Yes. You can only pay for childcare once you have a job. Exactly. So I'm actually going to visit a church today to see if we can get assistance with food. Dashere is waiting on government housing and getting by on donations and support from food banks. Do you have any financial support? Like food stamps or anything? I've applied, but they're waiting on a paper or something, and they said they would give me assistance, so I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, bud. <laughs> Let's get that burp out, huh? <laughs> You're just a happy little guy. Yes, are you just a happy little guy? <laughs> I'm a baby. Any teeth yet? No, not no. yet. They're coming. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh there it is. It is. <laughs> I think this is your food here. Thank you so much. You're Thank you. I see you have a little one. Do you need like diapers? And yes, size, I do. What size? Diapers? Size threes. Here you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. May I give you a hug for that? Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, that just fixed my day. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I'm glad I made you that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. That's I a good know. hookup right there. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> like, I really don't have anything. I'm thankful. I was just wondering, like, oh my God, like nobody's really here. Oh my God. So, so yeah, it's, it's really good to feel like this right now. So, I'm really thankful. <laughs> like, I can't believe it. Wow. You're a strong woman. That's yeah. a lot to be dealing with. Yeah. The blessing of the very little mama. Oh, yeah. I love you. Uh, oh. Oh. Would you consider yourself homeless right now? Yeah. I've been homeless since... I was pregnant wow. and I didn't have my baby's father to really be there and help me out with money or things to eat or it was hard. My son gets a lot of love, but look where we're at. It's, it's tough when people say that they care, you know, and you really see if they care. You know? in, in the moments when you really need it. Yeah. What are some of the other things that people don't realize about your situation? That I'm in this situation. The type of person I am, I've tried. And I'm still trying, so. I don't know, I'm just tired. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm doing everything alone, so. This is hard. You're gonna be so smart. You're gonna be so sweet. You're gonna treat women so good. He's gonna be so amazing. Him already is. The Christian right is far from done. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wrote that the same argument used to overturn Roe could be used in cases that establish the right to contraception and same-sex marriage. And the anti-abortion rights movement is now strategizing how to make abortion completely illegal state by state, including by prosecuting those prescribing abortion pills. You know, it's almost analogous to kidnapping, where um, if someone took your child out of state, and that would be a federal crime. What about a child in the womb who is solicited out of state 
by someone who is promoting drugs, would the state have an action there? Will you pursue any cases that could try to categorize pregnancy termination as manslaughter or homicide or in some way go after the mom? I and ADF are, are completely against criminal sanctions on the mother. I think the sanctions should be on the perpetrators, which is either the abortion providers, a doctor, a facility, or mail order pharmacist selling abortion drugs. Are you gonna pursue other precedents in the Supreme Court? Griswold dealing with birth control, Obergefell dealing with same-sex marriage. The majority of our cases that we want are very simply freedom of speech. That's really what it comes down to. Whatever you believe, whatever you want to say. In the United States of America, you should be able to say that. And that's the overwhelming majority of what we've done in the Supreme Court. It's crazy for them to say that they speak about freedom and want freedom for all. What about my choice to my own anatomy? What about my mental state? What about my health? An ideal America is where Americans are free to live and work according to their beliefs, where marriages and families are strong and healthy. That, I think, is the ideal for everyone. Strong, healthy families to me look like two parents or even just one parent who loves their children, is able to support their children. They have a clean, warm bed to sleep in at night. I want a family. I want my own child. I want to have those things. It's just, it wasn't in the cards right now. But what I've seen time and time again is that is a very short-term shock, surprise, sadness, and the joy of that baby, the joy of a human life is, um, is immeasurable. And women are strong, women are capable. We can figure it out. What do you say to people who say, no, you can do it. You can have a baby, you can go to school, you can work, you can live the life you want to live. No, how about no? How about you listen to me? How about I tell you what I'm good for? Don't tell me what I can do. I'm telling you, sitting here, telling you, I can't do this. Listen to me. My words matter. The Turnaway study started in 2007. We recruited just under 1,000 people from 30 abortion facilities across the country. And each facility was chosen because if you were too far along in pregnancy for that site, no other abortion facility within 150 miles would do an abortion later. So really the idea was to recruit people who were just over the limit, who we thought would carry the pregnancy to term, just under the limit, who received an abortion. And we followed all these women for up to five years, calling them every six months to do interviews in English or Spanish. Has anybody done a more thorough study in this area? This is definitely the biggest study of the consequences of abortion uh, in the United States. How much more likely are women to slip below the poverty line if they're denied an abortion? So we found that women are more than three times as likely to be below the federal poverty level if they were denied an abortion compared to receive it. One important thing to note is that being denied an abortion affects so many aspects of people's lives. Their chance that they're in a better relationship, the chance that they've found a better job, that they have more stable housing, and all of those together mean that people who are denied abortions are less likely to have the circumstances later to have a wanted child. Those mm -hmm. who receive their abortions are more likely to go on and have a wanted child later, under better circumstances. State governments are passing these laws are they also allocating enough funding to support these women? No, the, the public safety net is not strong enough to support low-income mothers, whether the pregnancy was intended or unintended. Women are much more likely to report that they don't have money for basic living needs like food, housing, and transportation when they're denied an abortion compared to receiving it. It looks like 26 states are likely to attempt to outlaw abortion. What concerns you? It is the case that people with resources will travel out of state, but the people without resources, the people who are low income, who are minors, who are disabled, who are in hospitals, can't just pick up and travel out of state. And so, in fact, these laws in these states mean that the most privileged may go on and get their abortion, and the least privileged, the most um, already experiencing hardships, those people will be the ones who carry unwanted pregnancies to term. I'm Michael Lermont, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. 
Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.